Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, Drug Discovery World webinar uh, entitled The Kinetics of Drug Receptor Binding. Why is it important and how can we measure it? Uh, it is increasingly appreciated that the rate at which drugs associate and disassociate from receptors, the binding kinetics, um, directly impact drug efficacy and safety. However, the molecular determinants of drug receptor binding kinetics remain poorly understood and are, are rarely measured early in the drug discovery process. Today, we are delighted to have a panel of three experts from this field who will review current methods for measuring uh, receptor kinetics and then describe some novel new approaches. So let's meet them. Um, firstly, we have Dr. Stephen Charlton, who is currently Professor of Molecular Pharmacology and Drug Discovery at the University of Nottingham uh, here in the UK. He is followed by Dr. Louise Affleck, who is Business Development Manager for Life Sciences uh, at Cease Bio Bioassays. Uh, and then she is followed by Catherine Walk, who is a senior application scientist with BMG LabTech. I'm Robert Jordan, publisher and editor-in-chief of Drug Discovery World, DDW, and I'm going to serve as your moderator today. Uh, at any time during the webinar, you can send in your questions for our panelists by writing your question in the Ask a Question box uh, and just pressing OK. Um, the panel will try at the end uh, answer, to answer, uh, obviously, as many of your questions as time permits. Um, and um, obviously, we will try and get back to you if we cannot answer the questions within those times. So, okay, so I think we're now ready to go. Um, so if you're sitting comfortably at your screens, let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is, as I say, Dr. Stephen Charlton. So if you're ready, Stephen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert, for that introduction. Um, in this first talk, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce the concept of the kinetics of drug binding and ask really the question of why it might be important, not only in terms of um, achieving better clinical efficacy, but also to better under understand and interpret in vitro assay data. Before I um, launch into uh, a discussion around kinetics, I want to introduce um, uh, the team that's been working on this at Nottingham. Um, the Molecular Pharmacology and Drug Discovery team um, moved to Nottingham about 18 months ago. We were previously working at Novartis Respiratory Group in Horsham. Um, and when that closed down, we decided to move to Nottingham to join the already well-established cell signaling research group of Steve Hill. And we, Because we've come from a drug discovery background, we have two uh, main interests. Our key academic interest um, for a long time has been working in the area of kinetics, understanding not only the basis of kinetics of, of ligand binding, but also the, how that might affect signaling um, observed in cells. But we also have an interest in drug discovery, um, initiating our own projects, um, also working in collaboration to do um, collaborative projects or to support um, other people's internal projects in terms of assay development and detailed mechanism of action studies. So the first thing I'd like to do is really introduce um, binding kinetics. And uh, really the top um, left-hand panel here shows us the simplest reaction scheme of a ligand with receptor. Um, and we have binding according to the law of mass action. The rate of that uh, ligand and receptor binding is driven by uh, an association rate constant. Um, and that is, um, is, has units of both of time but also of concentration because the association rate is concentration dependent. The dissociation rate of the ligand from receptor is, is defined by the dissociation rate and that is only governed by time. Now, the ratio of the dissociation rate from the, uh, over the association rate defines the affinity at equilibrium or the equilibrium dissociation constant. And we, um, we often use this um, measure as the, our measure of affinity simply because the kinetics of binding are difficult to measure compared to saturation at equilibrium. The bottom left right hand panel um, shows the association um, of a drug um, to a receptor. And you can see it proceeds over time and to a point where it reaches a plateau. Now that plateau um, is the point at which it, it, it reaches equilibrium. That doesn't mean that the system is now static and that all ligands are bound to receptor. What that means is that the rate of association of ligand and receptor is equal to the rate of dissociation. So the system is still very dynamic. We have binding and unbinding events at that point, 
um, but we have no net gain in ligand receptor complexes. Now I've labeled, I've, I've highlighted two zones there. The first one in green is the equilibrium point, point part that I've just described. There's a, also a whole section there in terms of time where the system is not at equilibrium. And this will di di um, differ depending on the kinetics of each compound. Um, and I'll be coming back to this non-equilibrium situation um, in a few slides time. In terms of uh, measuring kinetics, I just wanted to introduce why we might be interested in it um, in terms of at least clinical benefit. Now, perhaps the best understood um, or, um, or the best well-known um, benefit is in terms of enhancing duration of action in the clinic. Um, and, in cer and certainly for receptors, uh, I suppose the, the, the biggest um, uh, example of this for some time has been in the inhaled muscarinic receptor antagonist field um, for the treatment of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There are two molecules here, both from Boehringer and Ingelheim. Um, uh, the first generation, ipratropium, was needs to be dosed four times a day, but the second generation, teotropium, um, only requires once daily dosing. Now, although the pharmacokinetics are not identical, it was difficult for the, the team at Boehringer to, to really define why this was until they radiolabeled those materials and discovered that the dissociation rate from the M3 receptor, which is the target for these molecules, is much, much slower for teotropium than ipratropium. And indeed, that 34.7 hours could contribute a large component to the once daily duration of action. And since then, I've been working with um, um, a colleague um, in Brussels, Georges Vucalan, and we've done a, um, a series of um, simulations really looking at the impact of kinetics um, on duration of action. And, and certainly, you can um, extend the duration of action with a slow off rate beyond the point um, where the pharmacokinetics means the ligand has essentially disappeared from the system. But, this, but the key point is here that this only really has an effect if the residency time outlasts the drug exposure in terms of pharmacokinetics. So if you have a very long um, pharmacokinetic profile, then off-rate plays um, no part really in the duration of action there, and that needs to be considered. So that's well established, um, but something that's probably um, less well known is the potential benefit for enhanced efficacy. Now, competitive um, drugs um, in an equilibrium situation will cause rightward um, shifts of concentration response curves to agonists with no reduction in the maximal effect um, in a shield type analysis. So this type of effect is surmountable and it essentially means that if you put enough agonist into that system, you will always be able to outcompete the antagonist. But if we go back to that point where I described before, where we have non-equilibrium conditions, then this, this um, uh, relationship falls down, and the compounds can appear to be irreversible or non-competitive, and this is termed insurmountable. An example of this is below um, for calcium signaling at the um, M3 receptor. Now here we have um, a concentration response curve to methacholine in the dotted black line, and we have th that curve in the presence of 10 times Ki concentration of a variety of muscarinic receptor antagonists. Now you can see that all those antagonists shift the curve to the right, but they also cause a reduction in the maximal effect achievable by methacholine. And the degree of reduction there is directly related to the off rate of those compounds. Now the reason this happens is, particularly in, in the calcium assay, is that it's a very rapid signaling um, uh, uh, system. And so between agonist addition and our measurement of our peak calcium response is often between, just between two to 10 seconds. Now in that time frame, if we have a, a slowly dissociating compound, it hasn't re-equilibrated enough um, to be fully um, outcompeted by the agonist. And so a number of those receptors remain blocked, even in the presence of a large, number, a large concentration of agonist. And this is why we see this insurmountable behavior. Now this can have um, important cons consequences in vivo as well. So if we look across at the um, right-hand panel there, the graph, this is an, an in vivo experiment now um, looking at rat bronchoconstriction. We've induced the bronchoconstriction using an IV dose of methacholine, and on the y-axis we're measuring um, uh, the uh, lung resistance. And you can see as we increase methacholine, we increase lung resistance uh, due to bronchoconstriction. But as we, as we add um, uh, our drug, this is given via the, the, directly to the lung, you can see not only do we shift that methacholine curve to the right, but we limit the maximal effect achievable. So you can see, even in, in a fully in vivo situation, we can see insurmountable antagonism. And this can have consequences not only for um, 
neuromuscular um, signaling, but also neurotransmission in, in, the, in the brain, anything that has a very rapid signaling um, uh, profile. There's also good examples out there that in other systems, for example, um, the CCR5 um, receptor antagonists to treat um, HIV infection. And Pfizer had a very nice um, series of data showing that um, antiviral efficacy correlated very well with the dissociation rate of those compounds. So off rate appears to potentially give us improved efficacy, but it can also have a downside. And a good example of this is in the, the um, dopamine D2 receptor antagonists um, used as antipsychotics for the treatment of schizophrenia. Now the original typical antipsychotics um, have very slow dissociation. They cause um, quite significant extrapyramidal side effects. These are Parkinson type um, side effects and through due to blockade of um, signaling in the nigrostriatal pathway. The newer atypical antipsychotics, um, like clozapine, um, don't have such an issue here. And it's hypothesized that these compounds have a more rapid dissociation. And because they're more rapidly dissociating, they display surmountable antagonism and therefore um, allow um, a small amount of signaling to occur. So don't completely block that system, therefore cause less side effects. So it could be that um, in some systems you might want to um, optimize rapid dissociation kinetics as well to avoid on-target side effects. But clinical benefits are not the only reason we need to understand kinetics. Um, we need to understand the kinetics when we're actually characterizing compounds in terms of their pharmacological properties. Now it's long been um, understood that if you don't leave an, an experiment, a binding assay, to equilibrate for long enough, you can either underestimate or overestimate the affinity of, of, a, of compounds depending on their rate of equilibration re relative to the radio ligand. And here we've got two examples of, again, muscarinic antagonists, teotropium and, and, and atropine, um, which can either be uh, appear more um, higher affinity or lower affinity um, depending on the time point. But something I really wanted to, to introduce, which is perhaps less well understood, is the impact on functional assays. Now, with functional assays for receptors, we have a number of different options to look at signaling. These range from very rapid signaling um, uh, assays, for example, confirmational change by um, FRET biosensors that happen in the millisecond range, all the way up through calcium, cyclic AMP, to very long readouts, either reported gene assays or um, late stage um, phenotypic readouts like um, proliferation of cells. Now, the key element here is that depending on where on in that time frame we measure our response can define where we are on our equilibration time point for our agonist. So a very rapid um, time point may mean that not all of our agonist has had time to bound to a receptor. So we may not have full occupancy. Whereas if we leave our system for much longer, we should achieve full equilibrium. <laughs> and we've been exploring this um, functionally for a number of compounds that agonists that, tend, that have slow dissociation rates. The first example here is a compound called C26 developed in Novartis. Um, this is a very slowly dissociating beta-2 adrenoceptor agonist, and you can see in the top left panel um, how it compares to um, a number of other clinically relevant compounds. And then we have three um, different um, signaling uh, readouts, um, cyclic AMP, arrest and recruitment, internalization. And you can see that um, for each of those different signaling um, systems, that C26 has a slower um, signaling profile in the early time points than either isoprenaline or adrenaline. But at later stages, it, um, it actually appears to be higher efficacy. Now, depending on when we take our uh, reading from, if we didn't, for example, do full kinetic reads, if we looked at the reading at an early time point, for example, where that green arrow is, you would call um, C26 a partial agonist compared to adrenaline. If you left the system longer um, and you looked at the red time point, you might call that agonist a super agonist. So, this, so the time point at which you measure these compounds can actually really define um, uh, whether or not you, you think, or how you define the efficacy of those compounds. And these data have um, just been published online now, if you'd like to read the paper in more detail. Another example um, was with a collaboration, again, that has, that has just been published um, with Monash University, where we were looking at um, a series of D2 receptor agonists. And they had a, um, a series of lovely data looking at um, many different signaling pathways um, across different time points. Um, and we identified that there's a, a, a compound by, by Fepronox, um, which has very slow um, uh, association kinetics. 
And you can see um, in the functional readout on the top right there that while um, rapinarol uh, actually gets less active with time, presumably through desensitization of that response, bifepronox actually increases its potency with time. So it behaves very differently. And in the bottom right-hand panel, sorry, left-hand panel, um, you can see a measure of ligand bias. Now, I don't have time to fully explain how this is done. The paper has been published and it's, and it's highlighted below in Nature Communications. Um, but the, but the, the summary is that if you look at an early time point, this compound by Fepronox appears to be biased towards G proteins at the early time point, but then biased towards um, phospho erc and, and that pathway um, at later time points. So what this tells us is that if we, we're trying to um, characterize compounds, we need to understand their ligand kinetics before we can really start um, uh, calling compounds a bias or, or really denoting their efficacy. So if kinetics are very important, how do we measure them? Um, now, in terms of drug discovery um, and thinking about this, what I've done is, is put a standard drug discovery um, scheme here, starting from screening through to hit validation and need optimization, and then finally on to, to development. And at the top of that, I've looked, just taken a, a very broad view of how many compounds might be tested at each of those stages. Now, kinetics traditionally has really um, only been measured um, using radiolabeled material, which, which tends to only be available during um, late-stage um, uh, drug discovery, where you have one or two selected compounds. And there, the kinetics can be um, uh, investigated using standard filtration um, type assays or SPA assays. But that, of course, although you can characterize your clinical compound, it doesn't give you any information on uh, allowing you to develop the kinetics um, per se as part of the optimization process. The advent um, and the introduction of, of surface plasmas, plasma resonance um, techniques has really revolutionized our ability to look at more compounds, particularly for um, soluble um, proteins such as enzymes. Um, there's still some issues in utilizing this um, inter with uh, membrane proteins, and some compound classes also have issues in terms of, of interacting with the chip. But certainly we can look at hundreds of compounds using this, um, and I do know some groups who, who actually run thousands of compounds through these systems, although it takes a huge amount of effort and multiple machines to do that. So what we were really looking for is a method that would fit in to this HIT validation phase where we could look at thousands of compounds in kinetic mode. What we wanted to achieve during this assay development was achieve a 384 well compatible system. Um, we wanted our receptors to be in our native lip lipid environment, um, ideally in a membrane, and certainly if we were able to look at in whole cells would be perfect. We wanted a system that was able to um, have a continuous read um, and detection, so we were able to look at um, kinetics in a single well. And it was important to us that we had an injector system because we needed um, to look at uh, uh, time points very early on after compound addition. And finally, we've done a lot of work previously looking at the influence of temperature on kinetics, so having full temperature control was also important. So really, with all those in mind, um, what we did is we, we looked at a variety of different systems out there, and we settled on um, testing the CISBIO Taglite um, assay system in conjunction with the BMG Ferrostar, um, which uh, in our minds fit these, um, these, uh, these requirements. So what I'm going to do now is, is stop there, and I'll, I'll hand over to Louise and, and then Catherine to talk through these systems, and then afterwards I'll come back and, and talk about our, our um, assay optimization phases. So I'll leave it there and um, hand over to Louise now. Thank you, Stephen, for that fantastic introduction into the Taglite receptor ligand binding system. Taglite is a fluorescent cell-based assay format, enabling ligand binding kinetics and ligand binding affinity determinations whereby a G-protein receptor is expressed at the cell surface and a SNAP tag is expressed at the end terminal of the receptor. The terbium can be covalently, is then covalently labelled to the SNAP tag. The, receptor, the ligand to the receptor is then labelled with the acceptor. When the, ligand, when the ligand, labelled ligand comes in close proximity to the donor molecule, the terbium, a threat event is generated. Unlabeled ligands, unlabeled test compounds can then compete off any labeled acceptor present, thereby preventing a threat. Taglite is easy to use, where the labeled cells are plated out 
And then the unlabeled compound of interest is added, followed by the labeled fluorescent ligand. As mentioned earlier, it's a competition event. So the, you'll measure a decrease in the FRET signal in the presence of unlabeled compound. The BMG FX reader is an ideal reader to detect the HTRF FRET signal. And Catherine Walk will later describe this in much more detail. So to wrap up, the tag light system enables ligand binding kinetics due to the no-wash homogeneous assay format. It is a non-radioactive, fluorescent, and robust signal is generated. I will now pass on to Catherine Walk at BMG Lab Tech to describe the Ferrostar FSX in greater detail. So thank you very much, Louise. Um, my name is Catherine Walk, and I'm an Applications Manager with BMG Lab Tech UK. I will be talking today about the Ferrostar FS instrument used by Stephen in his research to date. I'll be covering the standard features of the instrument, but paying particular focus to those that benefit the kinetic tag light approach. I will also take an opportunity today, though, to also introduce our latest product innovation, the Ferrostar FSX instrument, the new gold standard for HTS. The Ferrostar FSX, for those interested in the kinetic tag light approach, will offer also advantages over the Ferrostar FS system, so it's worth noting um, in this presentation. The Ferrostar FS was introduced in 2009 and is now a very well established uh, solution for medium to high throughput screening, but its design feature is made to accomplish both high sensitivity and speed for all plate formats up to 3456. Key to the success of this instrument has been the use of dedicated read technologies for all read modes. With high energy xenon lamp used for optimal fluorescence excitation, a dedicated channel for luminescence, an ultra fast spectrometer for absorbance, and of course laser options for both alpha technology and most importantly for this talk, a TRF laser for HGRF. The system also includes a standard simultaneous dual emission for all the read modes mentioned on the slide, fluorescence and in particular TOFRET as is relevant to our talk today. So, the Ferrostar FS as is an easy to use system and utilizes an optic module concept. These barcoded modules contain all components needed for an assay, as with the HRF module that would be used by Stevens team. All filters, dichroic mirrors are fitted inside to avoid error in installation and to protect these components. Important for HRF is our use of dedicated redshifted photomultiplier tubes, as these are photon counting detectors and they offer the best sensitivity in this application. And important finally to the tag light approach, as Stevens previously mentioned, would be the injection and incubation system also available for the Ferrostar FS. Other standard features that benefit um, FS users in and around this GPCR area are obviously top and bottom reading capability. Um, this is controlled within the software, making it possible to read even the cell based tag light assay either from top or bottom with no user changes. Bottom read may be employed where using monolayers of cells. The advanced Z height detection possible from both top and bottom is not a general feature offered by most HGS units, but it does ensure the best performance um, in reading in either orientation. Finally, to make the system more ultimately suitable as a screening tool, the instrument includes plate barcode readers capable of reading west, south, and east, and also has a stacker option with a continuous loading feature. So now I come to technologies that have a, maybe additional impact or can help with setting up the kinetic tag light assay. Um, I've already mentioned the injectors and incubation um, setup. I can focus a little bit more on the injectors shortly. Um, but we also have high resolution wire scanning as shown in the image at the bottom of the page. And also that, that's useful for looking at receptor at expression levels. And also on the right hand side, you'll see a decay curve monitoring curve. Um, this is um, useful if perhaps optimizing timings or looking to improve um, assay sensitivity. So now I come on to the specifics um, for HTRF. Um, we offer 
two light source op options for exciting HTRF, a xenon flash lamp and a TR fret uh, laser. Um, as you can see from the data shown on the right hand side produced by Sysbio, um, the flash lamp and laser both perform well with great Z primes for both europium and terbium donors. Uh, but the laser that is optimized at 337 nanometers has a, a little bit of an advantage with terbium based um, donors, creating up to 30 35% um, increase in signal window as seen by the data. More importantly, for the tag light application, the more energy supplied with each flash of the laser as compared to the flash lamp makes it suitable for reducing flash numbers, increasing um, read or decreasing read times for both 384 and 1536 to achieve the fastest read times. We have real flexibility with our injectors. Users can add changeable volumes from well to well and add volumes as little as one microliter changeable in 0.5 microliter increments. Speed of addition can be regulated by the user to prevent cellular damage, uh, damage to the cell layer. And the most important point is that with the injector system sitting up directly above the well, we can inject and read simultaneously to ensure that we get the fastest dispense and read times over the plate, which is important when trying to sample at a high kinetic rate. Okay. So I mentioned I would come on to talk about the Ferrostar FSX system. Um, we have built on the success of the Ferrostar FS with this platform and have looked to re-engineer all of the optical components to gain sensitivity advantages in all of the major read modes. We also have faster read times for TR fret with a new faster laser, border dynamic range and luminescence and have introduced for alpha technology enhanced performance and also simultaneous dual emission for, for alpha plex. For time resolved fluorescence performance, I've previously mentioned that we've introduced a new faster laser system. The increase in laser speed would make it possible for Stephen to accomplish two possible outcomes. His team could continue to use the existing fast capture speeds, but increase the flash number by 50% which would result in higher signal counts, or they could continue to read with the same number of laser flashes and expect to see an improved plate read time by up to 33%, as shown by the, the data on this slide. I have two slides that exemplify this um, with respect to 384 and 1536 well plates to show you. The red line on the graph shows the drop in read time by using the same number of flashes, and the green line shows the gain in flashes at the same read time for a 384 well plate. Um, we have read time on the y-axis and, and laser flashes on, on the x-axis, and also for 1536, as shown here, to give you an idea of the plate read times. Now, obviously, for Stephen's application, speed is, is very important. So I would like to finish off with a brief summary. Both the FS and FSX instruments are perfect to handle this rapid uh, read kinetic HRF application. The laser and injectors are both important factors for the accurate determination of on and off rates. And the new Ferrostar FSX, uh, whilst offering general HRF assay performance improvements with its flash lamp, um, also with the addition of the TRF laser, Will, will give further benefits to the tag light application with respect to speed of reading or higher counts where as needed. Um, finally then, just to acknowledge um, our team in Germany and also the SysBio team that have been helpful in preparing this data, um, we hope that you will put us to the test as Stephen has. And at this stage, I pass over to Stephen for him to show some of the data that has been created using our uh, the tag light and the ferrous star system. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I'm going to um, finish now by talking about um, an assay development um, utilizing both SysBio um, and Ferristar um, to get a kinetic association assay using um, uh, HTRF. So really to refresh um, what our requirements were, again, um, uh, I've, I've talked this through already, but we, we really wanted um, something that had a continuous read in a 384 well format. Um, the systems, as I said before, were utilizing uh, Taglight and Ferristar. 
Um, what I want to highlight on this slide is that we utilize the beta-2 adrenoceptor as our model system, and the tracer ligand that we have is a fluorescently labeled propranolol. Now, the first thing that we needed to um, uh, achieve is the fastest read time possible. Now, the reason, reason we need um, this speed is because the way we're formatting this assay is to add um, our reagents into a well and start um, and take a read in, in, um, immediately then. Then what we do is move to the second well, add our reagent and read. And we need to do that to as many wells as possible before we then go back to the first well again and take the second read on that first well and then move back over that line. So we're rereading um, a number of wells at any one time. Now the faster we can read each one of those wells defines either the number of wells we can read in one, one read, one, one plate, or the time difference between each reading for each well. So for very rapidly equilibrating compounds, we might need very short time um, reads to enable to fully fit our kinetics accurately. So the first thing we wanted to do is understand how we were um, going to um, excite our donor. Um, and we had two options with the Ferristar, either laser or lamp excitation. Now what I've got here on the two top um, panels are a saturation curve um, to our fluorescently labeled propranolol, um, either using the laser or the lamp. And this is the emission at 665 nanometers. Um, and what we have here in the different curves is different numbers of flashes of either the laser or the lamp. Now you can see immediately that the laser um, is higher power, um, higher emission, and we get a much higher signal um, with far fewer flashes. If you ratio those numbers, um, they come out very similar, as you would expect. But what we wanted to do is really compare whether this higher um, overall window would give us better reproducibility and less error around um, repeated measurements. So what we did is we took 52 wells, all identical wells, um, in the center of a 384 well plate, and we read them um, in succession using a different number of excitation flashes. And you can see the number of flashes along the x-axis there. And then we have our error, our coefficient uh, variation um, on the, on the y-axis. And we were aiming a bit below 10%. Now you can see, if we look at the blue, that um, with our um, initial amount of flashes, uh, up to say 10 or 30 flashes, we started to get close to um, our target of 10%. But with that number of flashes, it was taking us um, really 30 seconds to read those 52 wells. When we moved to the laser, already, even just a single flash, we were getting less than 10% variation across those 52 wells. Um, and if we used three laser flashes, we were improving that still. Now, the benefit of using the laser is that we can get across those 52 wells in just four seconds using a single flash in scanning mode. Um, and so we felt that um, the laser gave us an opportunity to get much more rapid um, reads. Um, and so we, we utilized the laser from, from this point onwards, either in a single flash or with three flashes. So um, the next thing we um, really needed to do is to characterize our um, tracer ligand, our fluorescent propranolol. Um, and in the first panel here, you can see the dissociation kinetics, sorry, the association and dissociation kinetics of that ligand. Um, we've added the ligand and watched it dissociate over time. Um, and then at about 25 minutes, we've added our, um, a, a, a large concentration of competing compound and we can see the dissociation phase. All of those data were generated from a single well. The second panel um, looks at the association of different concentrations of propranolol. Um, and this shows that the association rate is concentration dependent. And we can globally fit those data um, to a, um, a model of association um, to generate K-on and K-off. And you can see that the, the numbers um, are fairly similar across both. But again, from that right-hand panel, we ha only have four wells from a 384 well plate generating all those data. But what we really wanted to do is to um, really measure the kinetics of unlabeled compounds. And to do that, we employ um, a competition associa association assay format. Now, this was first really described, at least in theoretical terms, by Matulski and Mayhem in 1984. Um, and it involves addition of both the tracer and unlabeled test compound um, to the receptor preparation at the same time. And then the association of the tracer is monitored and the association rate of the tracer will change in the presence of an unlabeled competitor. 
what we're able to do then is um, use this mathematical model that they described to fix a variety of parameters that we've already um, uh, fixed in our experiment, for example, concentration of ligands. We know our association and dissociation rate of our tracer. And if we fix all of that, we can then globally fit our, our association rate and dissociation rate for our unlabeled compound. And you can see on the bottom of this slide, um, we've used, utilized this um, methodology using radio-labeled um, methods um, over, over over many different years over a variety of different systems. And those are just some of the um, papers that we've published in this area. And you can go and, and, and learn a little bit more detail around this methodology. But for the HTRF, the first experiment we did um, in this competition mode um, uh, is, is highlighted here. And this is just one of the examples. So we've got salbutamol, which is a beta adrenoceptor agonist. Um, in the left-hand panel, in the blue, you can see the association of um, fluorescently labeled propranolol alone and then how that is altered in the presence of increasing concentrations of unlabeled salbutamol. Um, and the, num the data that you can see in the table below that we achieve um, by fitting that is um, fairly similar to that that we achieve using our standard radio label assay. Now, something I want to um, draw your attention to here is the um, difference in throughput. So our radio label experiment, we had three comp um, competitor concentrations, and that took a whole 96 well plate to generate those data. On the left-hand panel with the HTRF tag light system, we used uh, twice as many competitor concentrations, and it took us just seven wells of a 384 well plate. So you can see uh, a large improvement in, in um, throughput there, and also in reagent saving. Now, we, we ran um, in our test case a variety of different beta adrenoceptor ligands, and here we're comparing the on-rate and the off-rate measured um, from the HTRF versus our standard radio ligand assay. And you can see that the, there's a, a, a fairly good um, agreement there across those two systems. Um, again, though, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that each end for the above exper experiments required 25 wells um, using the tag light system, but 768 wells using our standard um, radio ligand binding assay. So we're able to generate those data um, in a much more rapid through, um, manner. Something, a question we asked ourselves really was how many concentrations of competing ligand did we need to get accurate um, estimates of our on and off rate? And I'm showing the same data here for salbutamol. But what I've done is at each point, with it, each one of those curves reaches equilibrium, which is the plateau point, we can generate from those data an IC50 curve that I've shown on the right hand side. Now what we did is we globally fitted all those data as I've shown you before. And then we just globally fitted the control curve, but just the single concentration of salbutamol, which is the lowest concentration we tested. Now that arrow denotes that there was less than 20% inhibition on our IC50 curve at this point. But when we used that, that, that single concentration alone, the fit that we got was not dissimilar, and certainly in terms of the um, equilibrium constant, the PKD that we estimate there, very, uh, was similar to that achieved by using the whole concentration range. And this is perhaps our first signal that perhaps that we might not need to run a large number of concentrations, and we might be able to generate um, on rate, off rate, and equilibrium dissociation constant values um, from uh, single con single competitor concentrations. So that was really our, um, our first foray into this system. Um, that was our, our test case. We then went on to really apply it to something that we were really interested in. And this goes back to our question around the D2 dopamine um, receptor field. Now, I've explained to you our interest in this, um, in that the typical antipsychotics have, uh, appear to have slower dissociation. The atypicals with lower side effects have a faster dissociation. But the studies from which these um, conclusions were drawn range um, across several decades several different labs using different technologies, different um, assay conditions. So to com it's very difficult to compare all those data in one, in, in one go. So what we wanted to do is utilize this high throughput system to look at a large number of clinically used antipsychotics to measure their dissociation rate and association rate and to see if this hypothesis holds true. Now when we were generating this D2 um, uh, receptor assay, we utilized SNAP-tagged D2L receptors expressed in CHO cells, and those were generated by Nick Holliday at the University of Nottingham. The tracer ligand we, had, we used was a fluorescently labeled PPHT, um, which is a, a partial agonist of the D2 receptor, and that was provided by Thomas Rue at Cisbio. 
Um, and throughout this, these experiments, we used three laser flashes on the ferrous star. Now, the first thing we did um, is characterize um, our tracer, PPHT. And here you can see at the top, we have a standard saturation binding analysis at equilibrium. And I really wanted to show you here the, the um, non-specific binding levels are very low using, using this system, even at very, relatively high concentrations of ligand. And then the, the panel below, we show um, an association kinetic assay of the tracer alone at different tracer concentrations. And you can see that very nicely obeys the um, law of mass action binding to a single site. And from that, we can derive our on and off rate to take through to our competition association assay calculations. So if we move on now to um, the experiments we did in the presence of unlabeled um, antipsychotic compounds, here's an example of some of those data. Um, in panel A, we have um, the IC50 curves generated from the equilibrium point of each of these experiments. And then we have three examples of compounds that show different types of kinetic parameters and, and different profiles in this system. And from this, we were able to, um, to generate um, um, the on and off rates for um, these compounds and, and really correlate them with um, the, the, the um, affinity constant, but also to look at whether or not they were related in terms of their um, side effect profiles. So in this top panel here um, shows um, the on rate on the left-hand side and the off rate correlated to the equilibrium affinity constant. And an interesting observation is that for the atypical um, uh, antipsychotics, the on rate appears to be quite well correlated to their affinity. But for the, the typicals, that's not the case. For, their, for the typicals, it's the off rate that appears to be driving their affinity. So that's an interesting potential distinct and distinguishing feature. But the real question as to whether or not um, the typical compounds have a slower off rate and therefore generate a more profound blockade of that system and therefore generate um, uh, extra pyramidal side effects um, when we looked at that question, um, we found that although some of, those eight, some of those typical compounds had very slow dissociation rates in the green, um, there was a significant overlap with the atypical. So there are a large number of typical compounds in there that show side effects, but which have off rates that are, that are very similar to the typical compounds, which don't show so many um, side effects. So although we have some support for this kinetic hypothesis, we've also identified that it can't be the whole story and that there's probably other contributing factors in this. Um, we've since um, done a, a much more full study and correlated these with clinical um, readouts as well. Um, and we have a paper that's submitted, um, which um, hopefully will be um, through the review process soon and available for, for download. So I just wanted to, before finishing, um, just go back to this question of enhanced sensitivity compared to IC50 assays. So we use the same type of analysis um, that I showed you before for the beta-2 adrenal receptor um, with this dopamine D2 receptor system. Um, and here is an example for rapinerol. So we have um, our, our different concentrations of rapinerol. Um, and again, each one of those curves is generated from a single well. We fitted all of those together um, in all six um, concentrations um, globally fitting. Um, and then we've um, just compared that to the single concentration that gave us the lowest inhibition, so less than 25% inhibition of our um, tracer binding. And you can see on the right-hand panel, when we compare the equilibrium dissociation constant estimates from both of those, whether we use all of the concentrations in that fit or just the one that causes um, less than 25% inhibition, there's a very good correlation of our affinity estimates. Now, what this means, firstly, is that we um, are able to um, predict um, affinity constants and on and off rates um, from fewer numbers of um, competitor concentrations than you need to generate a whole IC50 curve. But importantly, we can, um, we can by fitting this whole um, kinetic curve at once, we can um, generate data for compounds that cause almost no inhibition at the equilibrium. Um, so this allows us to look at much lower activity compounds and potentially in, um, opens up this system for looking at frag low affinity fragment screening for GPCRs. And this is certainly something that we're following up on now with a couple of test cases. So to revisit our, my initial question, what we were, what we were aiming to do, um, I believe that we have um, established now higher throughput assays for receptors. 
um, that allow us to look at the, the, the kinetics of unlabeled compounds. Um, successfully using the um, tag light um, combined with the Ferristar to generate this um, system where we can get kinetics from a single well of a 384 well plate. I put at the bottom there that I think that really this now supersedes our need to do full IC50 curves and indeed we get more information, we get the kinetic information out of this as well as our affinity constants. So um, I think this could essentially replace generating IC50 curves during the HIT validation phase. So to conclude, um, I guess across both presentations, um, I hope during the first presentation that um, uh, I, I gave examples of why I think kinetics can be an important um, element to look at in, um, in drug efficacy and safety, and really that slow off rate is not always um, better, and that the type of kinetics um, that you try to optimize will be de very dependent on the physiological system that you'd like to modulate. And then the second presentation um, shown that we've uh, uh, managed to establish higher throughput kinetic FRET assays, which allows the assessment of con um, kinetics at a much earlier phase um, in a high throughput mode. They're more sensitive and efficient than IC50 assays. And again, just to say that I really believe that this in, um, will open up our ability to do fragment screening in kinetic mode uh, on GPCRs. Um, I wanted to say with that, with the, the paper there, this is um, the first paper that's been published with, um, by us using this, this method uh, in Nature Communications, and this is the study I talked to you about previously in collaboration um, with the MIPS um, Monash team um, with Rob, Rob Lane and Arthur Christopoulos. Um, and we have uh, several more on the way. So finally, I just wanted to end um, by acknowledging um, people who did this. Um, the person I need to acknowledge um, most is David Sykes. Um, he's done a large amount of the, the work on the CISBIO taglight system and indeed has been working with me for many years um, on these um, competition association kinetics assays. Um, the other there are other people at Nottingham who have assisted here. Obviously, the collaboration with um, Monash University has been excellent with that Nature Communications paper. George Rucalan has helped um, do a lot of simulations and modeling over the years. Um, and, of course, the teams at both BMG Lab LabTech um, and CISBio for their assistance um, and support while we generate these assays. So that's the end of um, that, that's the, um, the, the assay development phase. Um, I'd like, now like to hand over to Robert, um, who will open um, this up for questions. Well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, thank you to all of our uh, contributors. I thought they were all very valuable in their own right. Um, Okay, we now have actually plenty of questions, uh, but before we start our Q&A session, uh, I'd just like to let everybody know that um, the, this webinar will be stored on the Drug Discovery World website uh, and will be free, uh, available on demand. <clears throat> so the site will be www.ddw-online.com uh, Give us a few days to get it up there, but it will be up uh, hopefully sometime next week. Um, so, um, let's go to our questions, and uh, I think the first one uh, we are going to ask is from Benoit Fouchac. I hope I pronounced that properly, from Eurofins uh, Pharma Discovery. Uh, and he's asking, um, and probably this is to you, Stephen, what is the influence of the tracer's affinity on the kinetics and what is maximum ratio of affinities, i.e. Uh, tracer versus competitor, that is acceptable? Right, okay, thank you very much. So um, I think that this was um, one of several questions I'm asking a, a, a similar a similar comparison between the, the kinetics of tracer and competitor. Um, the, the kinetics of the tracer certainly affects the accuracy of your um, kinetic uh, estimates that you get from this type of um, uh, analysis. Um, we find that if you have a very um, slowly dissociating tracer, then accurately ascribing kinetics for very rapid competitors is, is very difficult, and there is a point by which you cannot distinguish um, the kinetics anymore. So we've actually um, spent some time um, trialing different, different um, tracers um, to look at their kinetics versus um, compounds with different affinity. Um, we're actually at the moment um, in the process of finishing a paper describing this um, using both um, simulation data um, and also um, experimental data that we've, we've, done, we've used around the um, dopamine D2 system. 
So that will be out there. Um, I, I don't think it's as simple as to give a, a simple ratio of affinities um, right now, but I think that um, certainly if you look at some of the simulations that will, will be in that paper soon, um, then that will give a, an, an indication of the type of ranges that we'll be looking at. Good. Thank you, Stephen. Um, this one is from Ying Kai Wang from uh, Bristol Myers Square BMS, um, probably directed towards you, Kath. Um, how does the Ferristar reader compare with Perkin Elmer's Envision or Viewlux? Kathy, you still with us? I'm I'm here. Okay, sorry, did you hear that? Sorry one? there, Robert. I I did. I did pick that up. I a little bit of a malfunction there with the mute button. Apologies, everybody. <laughs> um, I won't take too much time away from the technical questions. Um, the Ferristar SS and SSX have probably some of the best specifications for uh, drug discovery. Um, with respect to all read modes. Uh, so the time resolved fluorescence uh, TR FRET application that Stephen's talking about here, the fact that we use um, photon counting devices means that we can get down to very low levels of signal. That in combination with the um, TRS laser means we can get a fantastically high signal in a short space of time. So in comparison to the Envision that uses a standard um, integrated um, photomultiplier tube or the Vulex system, um, we should be able to see um, hits that perhaps those systems wouldn't be able to see. And we certainly for this application should be able to achieve um, a very high signal in a very rapid read time. So have a look at the specifications. Please contact us if you want more information on, on the Ferristar. I would even like to try one in your lab. We'd be happy to help. All right. Um, excellent. So this one, Michael Bradley, Cyrus Pharmaceuticals. Um, probably, this might even be you, Louise, I'm not sure. What acceptor fluorophore was appropriate for use with the TB-labeled snap-packed protein? Um, it's really dependent on the GPCR in question. For some GPCRs, we found that the red acceptor has been better, and for other GPCRs, we found that the green acceptor has been better. So if you, look on, if you look on our website, you'll find the list of ligands that we've already labeled and we've already optimized as well, so whether they're red or whether they're green. Excellent. All right. Uh, we've had a few, well, some questions, some statements. This one's from uh, Professor David Calcoon, uh, I think I pronounced that correctly, from UCL, uh, who's uh, saying that the association rate constants you, you get seem surprisingly low. Um, usually we get 10.7 or 10.8 per second, um, not far from diffusion limit. Um, obviously one for you there, Stephen. Yes, um, yeah, and thanks to, to David for, for the series of questions. Um, very technical, and, and um, I should, should point out actually that David is um, uh, one of the really early pioneers in looking at um, kinetics and certainly competition uh, kinetics. Um, so I think um, the, the, the examples I gave did have um, slow um, association uh, rate constants. We do see for um, agonists that they tend to be slower than, than antagonists. When we look at antagonists, we do see rates um, in the range that, um, that David stated there. Um, but I think this really could speak to another concern that, that, that David raised in, in, in another one of his questions about the use of this simple um, single site um, analysis to look at agonists. Um, now, the thing that agonists do is they can change the conformation of, of, your, of, the, of the receptor, so you potentially have multiple sites that you're looking at. We try to um, limit that as much as possible by inc including high concentrations of guanine nucleotide to, to drive at least away the G-protein dependent stabilization of a high affinity state. But there's no doubt that even in the absence of an effector, there is probably some isomerization step happening here. So I think we need to be um, uh, we need to be very aware that the, the kinetics we're having, we're measuring here, um, are a global rate, uh, rate constant. There's probably a number of um, more microscopic uh, rate constants um, in, embedded in that that we can't detect at the moment for GPCRs. Um, although certainly for ion channels and a lot of David's work, um, you can start to drill down into some of those um, more um, specific rate constants for each isomerization step. But certainly for receptors right now, we, we have trouble um, teasing those apart. Um, so I think we need to be fairly pragmatic when we look at these numbers. Um, but I think that the slower 
we, I think there are two, two components um, controlling the association rate here. One for agonists is potentially um, this isomerization step that, that might be occurring. Um, the second, I think, is something that I'm quite interested in, and that's um, that, that the association rate um, is largely driven, well, it's, it's driven also, the, at least the estimation of the association rate, by the concentration of, of drug that you have in the system. Now, we assume that the concentration of drug that the receptor sees is identical to that that's added into the well, um, into bulk aqueous phase. Um, but some work we've been doing recently um, using um, fluorescently labeled compounds and fluorescence correlation spectroscopy methods has shown that the concentration um, actually close to the receptor itself within the membrane region or just above the membrane um, can be very different to that in bulk aqueous. So I believe that when we're measuring these rate constants, there is um, a component of non-specific um, local concentration of compound that's largely driven by the physicochemical properties of that compound. So I think we need to be careful when we're interpreting, interpreting um, association rate constants. So that was a very good question, um, and um, I think that what it shows is that, that certainly for GPCRs, we're not there yet, um, and uh, we've got a little, a little way to go before we can fully tease out all these microscopic um, uh, uh, constants. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and Stephen, can you help Kirsty Bennett out from Hectaris Therapeutics? Um, she's finding at the higher red agonist concentrations binding is higher at very early time points compared to later time points. Uh, can you explain why this might be? Um, I'm afraid I can't. Uh, we have done um, red agonist binding um, and we don't see that. So I think, Kirsty, the best bet there is to maybe just, just send me over some data or just maybe give me a call um, and maybe we can talk about your specific uh, question there. Um, it, uh, probably it would be easier for me to see the data to answer that. Good. All right. Um, I'll leave you to sort that out between you. Um, question from David Green at Vertex. Uh, are there any issues around the overexpression of tag light receptors relative to endogenous receptor levels? In other words, are you going to see inverse agonist type effects due to overexpression of receptors affecting the stoichiometry with coupling proteins and GPCRs? Are you directing that to me again? I have no idea. I think probably <laughs> yes. I think it probably is that for you, that one, but Stephen? Um, it, okay, that's, um, a, there are a fair few points in there. Um, I think that in terms of just the, the simple overexpression question, um, the, the good thing about um, these, these um, time resolved fret um, systems is that um, it's a very specific effect. So we're only looking at um, binding activity to a, a tagged receptor. Now, if you have a lot of other receptor in there, it could complicate issues in terms of potentially depleting high affinity traces. So if you get a lot of binding to, to endogenous ligands, you may reduce the overall concentration of ligand available to bind your tag light receptors. Um, but also, I suppose, if you were thinking about um, uh, what we spoke about before with, with agonist binding um, and maybe a dependency on effector proteins, then I'm, I'm sure, of course, that, um, that if you have uh, two ligands, uh, two, sorry, two receptors competing for the same effector, you, you may have a competition issue there. Um, I, I think we, I, we simply don't know enough. I think the only real uh, way we've looked at this at the moment is looking at G-protein dependent high affinity binding with, a, with agonists that I described earlier. Although there are now examples of arrest independent um, stabilization of particular receptor states as well. Um, these are all very good questions that I just don't think are, are well understood in the field yet. Um, and I think that there are other systems, there are people using BRET systems where they're using, rather than um, uh, uh, these two fluorescent ligands, they're, they're using um, a luciferase uh, to measure out and looking at receptor and effector coupling as well. So those systems in combination perhaps with these um, fret binding assays, we might get closer to that, but I, I don't think there's one straightforward answer for that question at the moment. Okay. All right. Look, Stephen, uh, Louise, Kath, thank you for those answers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we are about to run out of time. Um, there are an awful lot of answer, unanswered questions that you've uh, put up there. What I'm going to do is send these questions to our speakers, um, and then hopefully they will get back to you via email, uh, and uh, you can talk it out between you. Um, 
let me just remind you that this will be this webinar will be available online ddw-online.com uh, I'm free on demands give us a few days to get it up there and uh, we will be away um, well, I just also just thank you, the attendees, um, for 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 obviously attending, uh, and hope you'll join us again for another DDW webinar. Uh, and thanks again, once again, to our speakers and our sponsors, Cspio and BMG Labtech. Thank you very much, and goodbye.